Plants vs. Zombies Battle for Naperville is a sensitive topic for me. I have mixed feelings for this game. A ton of my earlier reviews and videos, especially in my Timeless Masterpiece series of videos, have a lot of criticism of the game. And it's pretty obvious from the very start that I was never the biggest fan. I pre-ordered this game on reveal, something I never, ever did and probably will not do again because I was confident in the team that developed this game. Podcat Games may be a small studio who peaked during the mid-2000s PC casual game hype, and they may be subsidiaries of EA, but they still have made some of the most impactful games of my childhood. Simple games like Zuma and the Peggle series sucked hours from my stupid childhood on my mom's crusty Dell laptop. Bejeweled Twist was interesting enough for me to buy just a few months ago, and Plants vs. Zombies absorbed me since second grade like no other game series ever did since on my little Nintendo DS Lite. When Garden Warfare came out, I'd go over to my friend's house multiple times a week whenever I could just to take turns and play, as well as Garden Warfare 2 until I finally got my own PC that could run games and picked it up myself. The series was full of charm, character, and humor that comes so far and few in between the buttload of games I've collected and played over the years, and it was one of the driving forces that inspired me to make YouTube videos right behind Minecraft and Gary's mod. Battle for Neighborville, to put it short. Hey, this is editing, Draco. I don't know what I was saying when I said short. Gives and takes from Garden Warfare and its masterpiece sequel. One of the biggest additions Battle for Naperville added was its single-player open areas, and these are personally the crowning jewels of this game and perfectly depict everything that made this series so special and charming to me. Four open areas, two for plants, and two for zombies, filled with characters, challenges, collectibles, bosses. It's basically all I could have ever asked for from a single-player game from a Plants vs. Zombie shooter with a massive amount of love and attention to detail added in every nook and cranny. Maps like Town Center connect multiplayer maps into one unison area, and there's clever details sprinkled everywhere that really didn't need to be there if someone hadn't thought of it themselves. You can see the Thunderdome, the multiplayer arena map used for the Battle Arena game mode, in the background high on a hill. You can see the entrance to Weirding Woods off of the Dock and Pressure Piers, the spawn for the Plants campaign in Town Center, as a miniature replication of the yard from the original Plants vs. Zombies, with five rows and five lawnmowers at the end of each. It's a tremendous effort to put into a single player campaign in your shooter largely known for its multiplayer gameplay, so it's charming to say the least. Collectibles are sprouted everywhere, as well as miniature missions and quests to follow outside of the main story. Golden gnomes are scattered everywhere, some in incredibly funny and clever places, others requiring platforming or puzzle solving to obtain. These came back from Garden Warfare 2's backyard, and collecting each and every single one was an absolute blast. Getting every single one unlocks two chests with a crap ton of coins and customizations to your kill screen, which are pretty neat. This is one of the first times in the series that humans are depicted, outside of Crazy Dave of course, and technically that Facebook game that got pulled down and I never got to play. A human hiding in his home with a zombie outbreak asks you to hunt down and find 10 exercise tapes for him to work out during the lockdown. Ironic. This also begs the question, how did the plants become sentient if the humans are around to see them? Do humans really know that the plants exist then? Where did the zombies come from? If the outbreak happened canonically recently, why are ancient civilizations depicting zombies instead of humans? The questions become more elaborate. I'll need to resort to the lore books for this one. Among all these collectibles are the elusive diamond gnomes. Similar to the gold gnomes but far harder to find and even harder to obtain, these are usually locked behind puzzles or trials to overcome. The first I came across was a puzzle requiring you to rotate pieces to make a shadow of an icon relevant to the series. I tried for hours and couldn't get past the second one. When you do complete it, The original Plants vs. Zombies 1 jingle plays for when you complete a level, and it put a massive smile on my face. And look at me, mate. I don't smile. The game and campaign especially is filled with the humor that makes the series so entertaining. Someone stuck at the bottom of a well asks you to find a crystal dog statue, and when you find it and give it to him, he smashes it. As a zombie, you diss a giant pickle, then cover it in orange juice to get rid of the pickle brine, and it fucking explodes. Each and every crevice of this game is just filled with lighthearted humors and puns everywhere, and it just made me smile or even chuckle in more than a few places. <coughs> Average white person. In Town Center, you can fight an elusive foe named Fantastico. There's genuinely an impressive amount of content to satisfy the Plants vs. Zombies itch in the campaign alone, that for how cheap it goes on sale, it's pretty much worth that price alone. The game even includes new classes. Not just the Snapdragon and the Acorn and the Space Cadet and the 80s action hero, but three more were added through updates, with a fourth planned but unfortunately cancelled with the game being cancelled.
However, despite all this positive talk, I did not take a complete U-turn on my perspective. It's never been a Draco dissertates without a little complaining, and this is going to be a lot. If you've played the Garden Warfare games, you might have noticed something is missing here. More specifically, there are over 100 playable characters? Wait, holy shit, is that real? One of Garden Warfare's biggest selling points were rifts, variants. This was honestly the biggest deterrence to my initial enjoyment of this game as well, because it felt like I was paying for a fraction of the previous games. What's left of the character roster is a very bland, mediocre hollow of its former glory. Variants were a form of motivation for playing, grinding out those coins to unlock incredibly unique characters one after the other, with so many in store for you to collect, but with no reason to play outside of unlocking randomly rolled cosmetics, it doesn't really give the same level of excitement as running to the sticker shop to get a new character, or get multiple cosmetics for one pack. Oh my god, this is the most boring crap ever. It takes two to three games to build up this much currency, and you can roll it and just get a stupid symbol for your kill screen. It's so boring. It's such a waste of time. And with no consumable items like potted plants or zombies anymore, this in a machine that will literally feed you experience for a coin fee doesn't really give you all the reason to play once you've hit that initial burnout. The perk system that replaced this really doesn't give room to experiment or make choices or builds, compared to just picking what's best and moving on. Talking about the Rewardotron, let's talk about the game's new methods of unlockables. Rux returns, this time functioning as a microtransaction shop, similarly to Fortnite's with rotating cosmetics, however the majority are usually only available through microtransaction currencies, watering down what once was an exciting blue moon arrival with truly unique top of the notch items to a store you probably won't interact with unless you want to unlock characters or check in for coin cosmetics that really aren't always that great. The prize map gives the player ways to unlock more cosmetic items through spending bulbs, a currency given at random or by completing assignments on a task board. These maps rotate from time to time, as well as the tasks associated. This initially interested me, especially since the cosmetics available actually look really cool, but the bulb drops are just too infrequent personally, and the tasks really don't give enough to get everything before it rotates without grinding pretty consistently. Secondary abilities that for some characters are almost integral to their ability to play are locked up in Rux's store, and only available using Rainbow Stars, the game's microtransaction currency. Something available from the packs for easy to obtain coins are now relegated to either paying with cash or grinding the ticket maps. Fantastic. Battle for Neighborville isn't a bad game. As a matter of fact, I think it's pretty fun. It's very, it, it very clearly was never meant to be a lazy attempt from developers, who clearly tried their hardest to make something genuinely refreshing and unique from their past projects, but more so the actions of Electronic Arts and putting over the shoulders of PopCap as they do with every talented studio under their vice grip. Supposedly, the game was meant to be EA's new multiplayer online service, meant to be continuously updated to keep a constant player base, akin to Destiny 2. It explains the odd social area, the hardcore implementations of microtransactions and cosmetics, and the drip feed of content before inevitably getting cancelled just a year later. A planned character never even came out after already in its alpha stage of development, the Iceberg Lettuce. The game is entertaining, but still disappointing to the people who remember the masterful gameplay of Garden Warfare 1 or 2, and it's upsetting to see such a loss for PopCab games, potentially one of its first since its earliest successes. Plants vs. Zombies 3 is potentially coming soon, with an interesting beta out already in certain regions. You know what would make this all up though? Garden Warfare- Peggle 3 baby, let's go, make it fucking happen.